Greetings, everyone. Peter Maravellis here, welcoming you to City Lights Live, the official online calendar of City Lights booksellers and publishers in San Francisco. We are celebrating the launch and publication of two new books by the wonderful Margaret Randall, Vertigo of Risk, Poems, published by Casa Uraca Press, and Loopy's Dream and Other Stories, published by Wings Press. And we're delighted to have Ms. Randall back with us again this evening. We've had a great pleasure of hosting her on many occasions in the past. The uh, new work by Margaret Randall is always a happening in and of itself, so we're delighted to have her back in our orbit. She's going to be joined tonight by uh, City Lights poetry editor Garrett Caples. Before we begin, as is customary before each event, I'd like to remind everyone we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples. I would like to take this moment to offer our respect and acknowledgement to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. Ms. Randall is a feminist poet, writer, translator, photographer, and lifelong social activist. She is the author and editor and translator of nearly 200 books and has received numerous honors for her work. Uh, she has um, lived for extended period of time around the world from Albuquerque to New York, Seville to Mexico City, Havana to Managua. Um, her published work includes To Change the World, My Life in Cuba, published by Rutgers University Press. Also, More Than Things, published by University of Nebraska. Her most recent work includes Thinking About Thinking and also Out of Violence into Poetry, amongst others. And joining her tonight, as mentioned, is Garrett Caples. Garrett is the poetry editor of City Lights Books, where he curates the Spotlight Poetry Series. He's a really fabulous poet in his own right, having authored numerous volumes of work. These include Power Ballads by Way of Books, Complications. He's also written a book of essays, Retrievals. His most recent work is Lovers of Today, also published by Wave. So please join us now in giving a warm welcome to Margaret Randall and Garrett Caples. Welcome to City Lights. Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Garrett, too, for accompanying me tonight. Um, and thanks to everybody who's here. So um, I'm going to read from two books tonight. Uh, during COVID, I suddenly found myself writing short stories for the first time. And then I realized I had a book, Loopy's Dream and other stories. And uh, Wings Press published that at the end of last year. It's not... Um, science fiction that's not futuristic, but all the stories bend memory, time, or space in some way. So I'm beginning, I'm going to begin by reading the first few pages of one of the stories. It's called El Lugar. When I first went there so many years ago, El Lugar was the smattering of one room adobe houses in a hollow surrounded by low hills that changed colors as the day unfolded from the deep gray blues and purples of early morning to the baked brown of midday to their crowning moment in late afternoon when their gentle shoulders glowed like the bright pink flesh of a watermelon. The houses were a uniform cafe con leche the color of the earth in those parts. The earth produced beans and chili so hot it would make you sweat, a few scattered milpas with their stunted ears of corn, small round squashes, and some coffee plants in the broad shade of the occasional mango tree. A few thin horses, goats, chickens, and the usual skinny dogs roamed freely. A truck that was part Ford, part Chevy, with a Dodge hood ornament, was parked in the shade of an old tree. It looked like it had been there for a while. No one knows, no one now alive knows when or how El Lugar got its name. Not even old Agatha remembers although she could tell stories of rebels who didn't know the 1910 revolution had ended and were still holed up in the hills when she was a girl. She would trace Via's great belly in the air with one bony arm as she pulled her rebozo tight about her with the other. 
the rebosa was identical to those worn by all poor Mexican women, a close dark weave flecked with threads of white, its fringe sparse after so many years of being scrubbed against a stone washboard. The villagers told me Doña Agatha spoke with ghosts. She would follow them around El Lugar, listening and nodding her head in deep conversation, even laughing at times at a shared joke. Some of the older women, a generation younger than Agatha, but still ancient, might ask her to inquire about Tio Agustin or Doña Sofia, she with the forest of warts on her face. Agatha brought back stories of the dead, the answers to troubling questions, condolences, reassurances, premonitions. If it were true that Agatha was really 112, as she claimed, she would still have been a very young girl when the rebels came through that Chihuahua hill country. But her childhood memories would have been reinforced by the stories her elders told. I always regretted not having spent time with the woman. On my first visit in 1971, someone pointed her out to me, but I was too concerned with my own problem to pay attention. A few years before, I was told, someone from a European country, I no longer remember which one, made the difficult journey to El Lugar with the sole purpose of speaking with Agatha. He said he was traveling the world, interviewing people who'd lived more than 100 years. When describing the European, the villagers made small gestures of someone writing in an invisible notebook with an invisible pen or pencil. Agatha received him with her toothless smile and a Nescafe jar of berry wine. She answered all his questions, but the lack of an official birth certificate prevented the visitor from including her in his study. As to the village, village's name, someone must have asked and someone else referred to the small collection of houses as El Lugar, the place, and the name stuck. It was never replaced by the name of a battle or a saint, an unusual rock formation or singular tree, not even with that of a large landowner. There were no large landowners in those parts at least not by the time I stumbled into that world. What brought me to El Lugar? Curiosity and chance. Curiosity about what might be down that dirt road or over that hill. I was 18. I'd quit university mid-semester and headed south in my 1966 yellow Volkswagen Beetle, unsure of what I might find but eager to explore. I was driving through Mexico's state of Chihuahua, a desert landscape with mountains that beckoned on either side of the long straight highway. I'd heard about ancient ruins and petroglyphs, small villages where the inhabitants had scant contact with the outside world. I was drawn as well by a web of ruins no longer visible to the eye, the strangely shaped hill that surely hit a pyramid, bits and pieces of clay pots painted with geometric designs you could reach down and pick up almost anywhere. I had the sense I could smell some previous life, its mesquite fires, the lichen clinging to stone or moist texture of adobe. So I'm going to I'm going to stop the, uh, here and you'll have to buy the book to find out what the protagonist discovers down that dirt road and how it impacts her life and to read other stories in the collection. The other book that I'm presenting tonight is Vertigo of Risk, my most recent poetry collection just released this past week by Caso Raka Press. The first part of the book is called Dearest, 
It's composed of 19 poems in the form of imagery, um, in the form of imaginary letters to loved ones who are gone. And by gone, I mean, I mean, who have died. I'll begin by reading four of them. So this first one is called Dearest Ruth. Dearest Ruth, thank you for coming. If only in my dream, your visit surprised me after the awkwardness between us last time we spoke. Of course, I knew you were raging, confined as they had you, longing for the Lakewood Avenue house and your morning walks around Fresh Pond. You asked if I'd read your piece on Proust. I said, yes. You asked what I thought, and I told you it's not finished. You need to end with a warning, I said, about consumer capitalism. Use Hillary as an example. And then wondered why I ever thought I should give you advice. Your addiction to a great man surely allowed you to understand the writer who needed seven books to explore the psychology of memory. In my dream, you reminded me our memory was born in that country where we met, that country like a broken body now, struggling to breathe. Loving you as I did, I'm glad you didn't live to see it all come undone. The questions we nurtured disappearing on eroding shores. But why Proust? Why not some obscure 14th century woman alone in her lab, reading another woman in fading light? So that one was for Ruth Hubbard, uh, a feminist biologist who was born in 1924 and died in 2016. This next one is for Mark Baer. Uh, South African novelist, 1963 to 2015. Dearest Mark, are we still on speaking terms after that phone call echoing through time? A stranger's voice pronouncing words I tried to erase before they could take up residence in my ears. Your giant heart exploding like calcium and rain, tiles, tales of childhood in the bush where rhinos challenged a queer storyline and the road to your future stumbled. Years, and I'm still angry you left so abruptly. Not angry at you, but in a world where death devours without warning and we are abandoned to the silence of suspense. Zeus-like body preened, preened and groomed, feet that ran double marathons on the blood-soaked earth of your first home and the convoluted byways of your second. It isn't your body, but your mind unfinished novel and arguments that hold me in close embrace, fingers braiding and unbraiding memory through narrow crevices of shame. In pain, you, com you combed those rebellious strands, matted with their slime of lies, nurtured each, each to a rebirth banished by many, understood by those willing to risk fictitious comfort. You showed me love of oneself, leaves space for the presence of friends, if they can listen to their own truth. I hesitated, then said yes, and never looked back, except in this vastness of wanting. The next one is for Ilda Gadea, 
she was a Peruvian economist and Che Guevara's first wife, 1925 to 1974. Dearest Hilda, you never said a word about the cancer, even to family or friends, your face growing thinner, pale beneath that beehive of painted curls and the economist's mind. Better known for your husband, he of Don Quixote fame, after he left, you were judged by patriarchal protocol, a lens that rendered you invisible. I remember our meeting in Mexico, those fierce days of rebellion and repression destined to do us in. You predicted as much. And when we coincided in Lima, another fateful October, El Cristo Morado blocking our attempt to cross that city of stubborn tradition. Rarely, Hilda Gadea, always La Primera Esposa del Che, until you told your story, and even then few acknowledged you brought him into the fold made him the hero he would become. I want to believe you will have a second chance, another time in which to speak and act on your own behalf and without so much as a murmur of denial. And finally, uh, from this series, uh, this last one I'm going to read is for Paul Blackburn. One of my generation's best poets gone much too soon, 1926 to 1971. <clears throat> Dearest Paul, it was hard to die back when death didn't enjoy its current range of action, grabbed people right and left, carried them off, without warning. They tell me you raged against the cancer and I know it must have been a struggle. You had so much yet to dream, to write, to do. Translation wasn't common practice. When you brought Provençal into English, surprised us with Cortázar's, Cronopios and Famas played games with our minds beyond those poems of your own that showed us the city we lived in, new to ear and eye, that little girl moving fast on the A train. Give the child words, give him words you wrote and he will use them. Simple as that. Given the gift, you knew how to pass it on. Later, I, le I learned of the pictures you took when I wasn't aware, mementos you brought from Mexico to my son's father, that he could trace the boy's life. When I walk the streets of any strange city, I think of you, filled with an energy you would not live to use, precious gifts we will never receive. So those are, um, that's a sampling of the dearest poems. And the second part of Vertigo of Risk contains poems rooted in, in those themes that I've always been exploring. Um, I've been exploring for years, landscape, memory, fear, survival. Uh, this is called Las Acequias. The acequias are dry, dust blowing where water once ran, dead alfalfa, corn stalks bearing sad ears, blighted kernels. The news came first in sweeping predictions, photos of cracked earth and sinking water tables, millions of plastic bottles, 
deformed. Then neighbors spoke of dying farms, their losses touching you, where regret pinches your flesh with its bony fingers. This morning, you turn the handle above your sink and nothing issues from the spigot, but the hiss of parched regret. Meanwhile, a multi-billion dollar space program announces the discovery of water on Mars in small but promising quantities. This, was in, this one is called Our Future Tense. Industrious never wanted to be a noun. It gazes in awe at other words, proud to be verbs or sassy little articles. Lazy doesn't mind being used to stigmatize nouns, confident as it is of being a verb at heart. Tone of voice is everything it explains to anyone listening. Brilliant claims it may proceed or follow the word it adorns, adding that extra glow or spicing up a mundane idea when confidence is lacking. Our vocabulary isn't to blame for bad jokes, self-serving anecdotes, and fanciful speeches. But our words do precede us into future tense. The sum of one and one. The earth was barren, battered by centuries of greed and salt of abandon. The poet insisted on planting a word, nurturing its hesitant roots and dreaming the rain that would bring it to life. That single word grew lonely at times, dependent on the poet's nurturing memories. Once the word stood strong on its windswept home, the poet planted another. She taught them collaboration and that the sum of one and one is always more than two. Time passed and returned with unexpected gifts. A field of words reaches for meaning among the weeds. The words are a poem now, its rhythms piercing a million ears crowding close that they may hear. This next one is called When I, when I Lived. When I lived, I passed through a place inhabited by ghosts. If you slow your step, you can feel them hiding in their fancy clothes among the trees. My shadow remains in that place, retreating midday and stretching its lonely arms in early morning and late afternoon as it sings off key to itself. Those who find themselves there by chance may feel my presence, the nudge of my elbow or smoldering of my desire, may hear the rustle of my words caught in the highest branches. But those who seek out that place as destination receive complete sentences, a music beyond their imagination, a certainty in the quickening of their pulse. Danger shows itself in many disguises, plays a rough game and gives you to know that only risk will take you where you want to go, leaving your name as Cairn. Geode. 
You need a hammer and strong hand to split this lump of gray rock, hiding its crystal beauty. A world where geology's heart takes you into its wonder. It's nature's piñata, shining star deeper and more hidden than that shower of candy and trinkets giving way to the birthday child's final blow. I would crawl inside it if I could, curl my body into its mystery, roam its billions of years, become one with the energy of its desire. Twilight. They call it the twilight of our years as if muted pinks and golds may produce one final show of light streaking across dulled eyes. I see bright colors, a sun powerful enough to sustain life on a planet where we th threaten it at every turn. Like some aloof house cat, Pity crowds my space, wants to take me by the hand and pull me gently to the finish line. But I am running my own race, celebrating rebellion along the way. My pace is passionate as it breathes. Your ministrations are obstacles I must avoid. Your sympathy lacks the agility of divination. Twilight is far too tame a horizon to catch the glint in my eye, amplify the words still assembling on my lips. Why not call it sunrise or dawn threshold to one last spurt of imagination, the unimaginable that brings us home. In a name, what is absent from a name, missing piece of the puzzle and what remains has us running in place for centuries. Shakespeare or Miles, Cleopatra, Che, Michelangelo, and the young girl we call Mary, or BVM for short, Blessed Virgin Mary, even knowing the Virgin designation is poor translation and the blessed was added by those who came later, adorning a symbol to place on the other side of the scale we wield to separate right from wrong, good from bad, submission to counter temptation and fear. Those known by first or last alone give us something of ourselves, something that wakes us forever. And I'm going to end uh, with the last poem in the book. It's called, Not Even the Cheetah. This race to say it all before the finish line heats up and I worry there's no more time for words. The poem you hear before I open my mouth. Half tortoise, but not half hare. Maybe cheetah, the fastest animal. At times I outrace myself and at others notice everything in my path. I must choose between two cadences, two directions, an option that wedges itself between my left cheek and shoulder like a violin that asks to be played by the virtuoso who hides her panic attacks beneath her pillow at night. Not a matter of dueling personalities, hesitation or days when everything breaks. Mine is a curious arc. I want to say it all before my journey fizzles and 
breathes its last. But if I can't, no one will be the wiser, not even the cheetah. So um, thank you. That's what I wanted to read. And uh, I hope uh, we can have some conversation now. Uh, Garrett, are you yes. up? Yes, well, th <clears throat> thank you, Margaret, for reading. Uh, that, that was really uh, great to hear your new uh, new work. And I thought I would, uh, I got a couple of light questions and I got some heavy questions. So I thought I'd start with the light ones and wade into the heavy ones, if that's okay with you. Um, okay. Uh, tell, could you tell people a little bit about the, the experience of writing these stories? Because this, you know, you, you're a writer who has over a hundred books and this is the first time in your career that you've done a book of short fiction. So could you, uh, you know, talk, talk about that happening to you as a, as a writer at this stage in your career? Well, I think, it, I think it had a lot to do with COVID. You know, it happened during um, the lockdown or whatever you want to call it when uh, we weren't going out much. Um, and so I guess that gave a different fabric to my life, the, you know, the being at home, uh, having more time to write, um, that kind of thing. But it was, really, it was peculiar. I mean, I, I, I wrote a story. Um, I, I think the first story in the book that I wrote uh, is the one called Lupe's Dream, the, the, the story that gives the title to the book. Um, I was pulling things, I think, from uh, current events and so forth, and then, you know, dreaming them into other shapes. And uh, I finished that story. I liked it. Um, I don't read much uh, short fiction myself. And so uh, Barbara, my wife, was uh, who reads a lot of, of short fiction and long fiction, was... Um, was kind of amazed that, you know, I, I had written this story and she liked it. And uh, then I found myself writing another and another and another. And uh, I realized that all the stories, um, what they have in common, or, or I guess at the end, what, what, what for me made them a book, made them a collection, was that they all bend memory, time, space in some way. They're not uh, really futuristic necessarily, although some of them are. Um, they're certainly not science fiction, um, but they're concerned with the changes that the earth and its inhabitants, us, are, are going through um, because of, of, of how we're destroying our, 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 um, our nest, you know. So um, the stories, in my mind, speak to those issues. Um, and then... You know, I, I I just kept writing them. They kept coming out. It was it was like a waterfall, really. It was like a rush, and then, um, and it was not over a long period of time, maybe two or three months, and then uh, all of a sudden there were no more stories. I just stopped, but mm -hmm. I realized that uh, they did hang together as a book, and that I had had a book, and and I sent it to uh, one of my publishers, and um, he liked it. So. Uh, I guess you know that's what I can say about that. I think I think the stories speak for themselves, um, and uh, I haven't written a story since then. Uh, I I write poems, I write essays, um, memoir, but um, no more stories. So I don't know. You know, I don't know if that's it for my stories, or if someday, when I'm uh, maybe a hundred and two or a hundred and three, I'll I'll feel like writing more of them. Yeah, I mean, do you, did you feel like the isolation of the pandemic did encourage that uh, type of activity? Because you know, obviously, we all, we all got to do a lot of a lot of hard thinking during during that time when we were you know not able to see people. You know, well, you know, in my case, um, I mean, I'm pretty much of a hermit anyway. I go out. I we have friends, and we see our friends, and and so forth. I travel a little bit still with my work, but. Um, it, it it probably wasn't so much being 
uh, isolated by the pandemic as feeling that the pandemic had changed the shape of our living or my living in a way, you know? Yeah. That's That seems more truthful to me. I mean, that seems to have had more to do with the fact that I wrote these stories because I can, I can honestly say that today I don't go out much, uh, and uh, but I'm writing poems and essays. I'm not I'm not writing stories. So, you know, I can't really explain it. Uh, I do know that that the way COVID changed our map had something to do with uh, the stories, but with writing them. But uh, but I'm still unclear on exactly what. Okay. Okay. And uh, I'm going to ask one question that I'm going to save the Q and A for the end that, that the audience is asking. But uh, Nancy Hegelson uh, asked, in, and I just happened to see it, uh, if uh, if the fiction of the mag magical realism of, of Latin American fiction seems like that, that's that's clearly some influence on this uh, this group of stories, because like you say, it's not science fiction. But it's also, it's not realist fiction either, you know. Yeah, I think, Nancy, um, you hit on something there. I mean, and actually, it's interesting because I hadn't thought of this before. But of course, I did live in Latin America during the boom of magic realism. And I read um, Isabel Allende and, and uh, Garcia Marquez and so forth and so on. So um, I... And even Latin American poetry is very sort of magic realist in a way. I mean, Hellman and Vallejo and so forth. So yes, I think that um, although maybe not consciously, uh, magic realism does influence these stories. They, they are very, I, I think that's a good way to describe them as being magic realist. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely thought so. And, you know, because no, knowing you as much as I do at this point, I can see like there's a lot of your life is in there, but it's transformed, you know, for the purpose of, of stories. Uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, well, uh, now thinking, thinking a bit about the, the new book of poems. Um, again, this is my last softball question that I'm asking the hard questions. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the, um, I was curious when I read through Vertigo of Risk, um, what is, what sort of uh, editing process do you go through with a volume like that now in the sense of, is it a chronological presentation or is it, are you grouping things uh, by theme? Because I would notice reading through it that there'd be like a sort of clusters of different poems, like you're wrestling with a similar idea. So I wanted to ask just how, how, do, you, how do you put a book like that together at this point in your life? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question um, because uh, it's true, there are clusters. Um, the, the poems were not written um, in any chronological order. They don't appear in you know, the order in which I, I wrote them, certainly. Yeah. Um, the, I, I wrote all the dearest poems uh, at once. You know, those poems were written, uh, not necessarily again in the order in which they're published in the book, but I did write them just, you know, um, as a group. And um, I guess that has to do with, uh, I'm 86. And so naturally more people I'm close to are dying and, you know, you miss them. And, and, and those letters are, are sort of uh, letters to people I, I love, I've loved or still love who are gone. Um, the other poems, I think you're right. Um, I, I will become kind of obsessed with um, a particular issue, it could be, and they're broad issues usually, it could be um, environmental, the environment, it could be migrations, it could be fear, it could be memory. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll write a poem and then I'll write another poem and perhaps another and another, uh, sort of looking at that issue from different angles or addressing it from different angles. And uh, I tend to group those poems um, together in the book, just because I think it, it might be interesting for the reader as well to, um, you know, read a poem about a particular issue and then look at that issue in another poem from another angle. Um, but usually, um, when I when I have 
enough poems for a book. And I think that they go together as a book, that they work as a, as a whole, as a book. Um, you know, then I'll just um, print them all out and I'll spread them all over the floor and I'll look at them and I'll decide on on a um, on an order for them. And I've done that with all of my books. I have a book coming out also from Casa Uraca Press, a book of poems um, in the fall called Home. All the poems in the book are uh, deal with the idea of home, homelessness, home, um, the home that we carry with us, the, the homes that we find, the homes that we flee and so forth and so on. So, you know, it was, it was harder with that book uh, deciding on an order because they're all really uh, about the same, the same thing yeah. uh, felt or seen from different points of view. Okay. And um, yeah, and so is there, do you, um, do you, do you finish a book of poems and start, start the new one or is there an overlap? Because, because like you say, it's not chronological and stuff and you are grouping things by theme to a certain extent. Do you, did, did, the, did like writing that book overlap with writing this, the book that's come out in the fall or? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't just write poems and then decide I have a book and then go on to the next book. They yeah. very often overlap. I, or I, I write a poem that I like and I realize it doesn't go in that collection. So I'll just put it aside and then perhaps later I'll, I'll, be writing a, a book where it does fit. And so it works like that for me. Okay. okay. All right. Now I want, I want to wave, wade into the heavier, uh, the heavier questions. Um, because I think one of the things that unites Lupe's dream and vertigo of risk sort of thematically is there is an, a sort of intensity of, of meditation on death in there. And without being, you know, without being more morbid, I was wondering if we could discuss this a bit, because obviously as an older person, you have to think about this, you know, and it, and it seems like there are, there are stories in the book where it's all, you're almost imagining your own death at times, or you're imagining somebody else's death in their poems, you know, like the poem When I Live that you read, you know, that's imagining somebody sort of communicating with you after your, mm -hmm. after your death, or even just all of the dearest poems too, being Right. being all people who you've lost over the years. And so, yeah, but I just you, want to talk, talk about that because you really confront this head on rather than... Right. Uh, no, yeah. and I appreciate the question. I don't have any problem, as you can probably tell, um, talking about death or writing about death. Um, I'm not particularly obsessed with my own death. I happen to think I'm going to live to be about 107, so uh, that may be wishful thinking, but <laughs> uh, I don't... I don't you know, I'm not I'm not concerned about my own death and I could die tomorrow. Um, but, you know, at my age, you 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 do um, you do lose people, a lot of people. And um, I think that I'm fascinated by death in a way because. Um, and I hope it's not an, an obsession, but I'm just one of those people who doesn't believe that in a hereafter of any type or, you know, I don't. Uh, I think you die and and that's it, you know, and what remains is what you've left in the memory of the people who knew you or loved you and and your work, perhaps, you know, if you're lucky. So um so um so yes, I guess I guess just to try to answer your question that um maybe it is on my mind because of my age, or maybe it's on my mind because um I've lost. Uh, quite a few people recently in the last few years, um, or maybe it's on. Maybe it's always been on my mind. I mean, it seems like a big, a big subject like memory, like birth, like fear, like love. Um, so it seems a, a worthy um, subject to write about. Yeah, and it also, as you as you say too, it's not it's not just to do with the the fact of your age at this point, because you, you're revisiting people, you know, people who died in the 70s and Correct. things like that. Like, you know, like I think about a poet like Paul Blackburn who doesn't even reach 50, you know, right. so it's sort of, Paul it's a human was, problem. Was, yeah, Paul people. was one of the first people uh, that we lost. Uh, I mean, back then, 
a fellow poet or a friend dying was a very unusual thing, you know, yeah. and, and and Paul's death was certainly shocking. Um, and it was a terrible loss to those of us who cared about him. So, um, yeah. And, and you know, even the, the, the dearest poems, I should also clarify by saying that um, some of the uh, people addressed in those poems are were very, very, very close friends. Um, Laudette Sejourné was one, uh, Mark Baer was another, uh, Felipe Edinburgh, um, Maru Utaf, et cetera. But some of them were people, for example, there's the poem for um, Paul, um, uh, well, Paul Farmer. Um, Paul Farmer who, who um, started um, Partners in Health. I don't know how many of the audience know his name, but it's an extraordinary, he was an extraordinary doctor who um, worked in um, Rwanda and, and in Peru and, and in other countries in the world. And um, Paul uh, Farmer and I met exactly once and spoke for maybe 15 minutes. He came to a poetry reading of mine in Boston, oh, probably at least 35 years ago. And, um, you know, so I, we weren't close friends, but somehow what he did with his life, you know, really, um, had an impact on mine. So um, the dearest poems vary from letters to very close friends uh, with whom I had relationships of years to, um, to people that in some cases I knew very briefly, but uh, who made a tremendous impression on me. Yeah. And uh, well, now let's take the, in terms in terms of this this uh, theme, I feel like it re it also relates to the the other major theme of vertigo of risk is in the title is the risk you know that there's a lot in the in that book about taking chances whether it's as a poet or just as a person you know taking chances in life and I guess I wanted to ask you your you know your your thoughts on that vis a vis you know, right now we're in we're in a time that is sort of you know discouraging a certain amount of risk taking, or there's a lot of emphasis on safety, you know, even in intellectual life. And so, what what do you um, how does that attitude strike you versus your obvious uh, you know you're obviously pro risk as <laughs> as a person. So. Yeah, well, I love this question, Garrett. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Actually, I I really value risk, um, and I have all my life, and I don't know exactly why. You know, I don't know what maybe happened in my childhood or the genes I have or, you know, whatever that made me that kind of a person. But I would always take a risk rather than not take a risk. And I've taken risks that have turned out to be big mistakes, you know, yeah. but I still am not sorry that I took those risks. Um so, you know, I, I'm somebody who wanted a child and decided to have one without being married in 1960. That was a risk. Um, I wanted to go to Mexico. I got on a, a Greyhound bus with my 10 month old son and we just went. Uh, I, you know, I went to Cuba, I went to Nicaragua. I lived in countries that were uh, uh, making revolutionary change or, in, in one case that we're uh, a country at war. Uh, I, I went to Vietnam before the, to North Vietnam before the end of the war, about six months before the end of the US war there. So my life has been filled with, with risk and um, it's just the way I am, you know, it's who I am. And so, um, I, I do understand why uh, today, people are perhaps less um, eager to take risks. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's the need for, to feel secure, to feel safe is a very legitimate one. And I even notice it in myself. I mean, I'm certainly not the risk taker at 86 that I was at 20 or 30. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, we go through different, different periods in our lives. And I don't, I don't um, really, um, 
I don't think about risk as I don't make a judgment about it. You know, I never have. I've never, you know, tried to preach that risk is like important or anything, but it's just my nature. And so um, when I write authentically, I write, you know, which, and I hope I always write authentically, it, I write about, I write from whom, who I am. And so I think that's why uh, risk appears in my work a very, uh, in a very primary way. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it's interesting to me, especially because you, you know, you've been involved with like, you know, the, the recovery movement and victims of sexual violence and stuff. And so you, you obviously do have a, a huge, uh, sympathy for the notion of people being safe, but it's never really. But also for stopping. risk. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, when I discovered that I had been, uh, a survivor of incest, um, and I didn't discover this until I was close to 50 in, in therapy. Um, I wrote a book called This Is About Incest, and it was a tremendous risk because at that time, nobody was writing. I mean, you know, scientists and psychologists and psychiatrists were writing about um, sexual abuse and incest, but it wasn't. Um, a, a subject that wasn't a theme for poetry necessarily or art. And I think that, in fact, my book was one of the first books, uh, books of poetry uh, that that was about that, that subject. And it was it, taking a tremendous risk in my own family. I mean, it was hard for my parents to embrace the book. Um, and yet it was interesting because I just felt that I had to write this book and I had to say what I wanted to say. And as a result of that, um, and then I went, then I read around the country with the book, from the book, and um, people started coming up to me after readings, you know, and telling me their own stories. And there were hundreds of stories. And so and, you know, it wasn't just I'm not I don't want to imply that it was only my book, because then you know, there were other books and, and so forth. But, um, and then, the, as you say, there was a whole recovery mo movement, which still exists, fortunately, uh, for people, for survivors of, uh, of sexual abuse, domestic abuse, rape, incest, and so forth. But I think that, um, and that risk wasn't easy for me in my own family, but it, it, it turned out to be worthwhile, because, uh, many members of my own family and close friends then after reading the book were able to come out with their stories and it was helpful you know so um i think when you when we're able to write honestly about issues that are important to people um it can work yeah no and i'm i'm interested what what you were you sort of uh hitting at this in your in your response too about uh that there there's a certain amount of risk of just doing this for you as a writer because and this is something we talked about in interviews before but because there was there was a sort of perceived opposition between sort of psychological health and revolutionary activity and you were you know you were somebody your your career as such was was sort of forged as a revolutionary type of poet and so you, I imagine you got a lot of flack or feed, you know, uh, blowback. Yeah, from... flack very much. So yeah. yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. Uh, there's there's always these sort of fads, you know, that exist in literature and in in art in general and in in life in general. So you know, it's it's uh, one day it's it's great to write about X, and the next day it's great to write about Y, and yeah so forth and and this even has to do with identity i mean you know it used to be you couldn't write as a lesbian and then when suddenly you could write as a lesbian you know that was a big market you know it's always comes down in this country to a market right yeah um but um i think that there's for a long time there's a there's been and it's not just perceived i mean i think it was very real it's getting less i think um fortunately, but there was a, a a definite separation from being somebody who was 
um, involved in what we would call today identity politics, um, uh, writing out of the lesbian experience or the black experience or the, you know, whatever, and uh, political uh, people who wrote uh, for, uh, a label, which I don't like, but uh, political poems for lack of a, you know, writing about social issues and so forth. Uh, which is sad. Um, it comes, I think, from McCar our history of McCarthyism in this country. I, it, it does not exist in other countries. I mean, I lived in Latin America for 23 years and read poetry by hundreds of poets. In fact, uh, in our magazine, we published over 700 poets from 35 countries, and they wrote about everything. Uh, so, uh, you know, that that inhibition or or sort of, um, you know, you can't write about political themes or social themes did not exist for those poets, but it, but it is part of our history in the United States, sadly. And I think it's, uh, you know, we've 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 overcome it to a certain extent at this point, but not completely. I think there are still uh, many poets and many um, publishers and and and. Uh, grand organizations and so forth that still do not want to see a poem about, you know, one of our everyday problems. Uh, they want to see, they prefer poems about raindrops and pine cones and clouds and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Not that you can't write a good poem about those, those subjects as well, but I mean, I think that this idea that you can or can't write about something is is really a very limiting, um, a, a very limiting idea, and it's uh, sadly, I think, still prevalent to a certain extent in the U.S. in 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 many circles. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you feel like being a poet has given you that a little bit more freedom, in the sense that, like, I feel like as a poet, you can almost write about anything, you know, and. I think you can absolutely yeah. write about anything. And, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I, I am a poet, so it's not like I feel a particular thing about it or that I can do something or can't do something in poetry. It's more that I'm a poet very much in the same way that I'm a woman or a lesbian or a lover or a mother or a great grandmother, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's just part of who I am. And so it's the way I express myself. And um, I have for many, many, many years, ever since uh, moving to Latin America, really, um, in 1961, I have not doubted that I can write about anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, there, there have been a few questions that have come up in the uh, in the chat. And I think I can see them all, so I don't need uh, Peter to shoot them at me. But um, let me just let me start with the uh, one. Uh, Chelsea Riley is asking, uh, you know, what? Given that you you had such an adventurous life and travel, uh, what place do you think of most most often, and why? It's an interesting question because I happen to um, love where I live. I mean, I get a great deal of, I'm nurtured by the landscape, especially of Northern New Mexico, uh, the desert, the mountains, uh, the red rock, uh, the open skies and so forth. So maybe, you know, the truth is that um, the, the place that, that most, <laughs> that I think of most often will be exactly where I am. There are other places that uh, I also think about often. I mean, I've been privileged to have traveled to many parts of the world. I often think of Vietnam, Vietnam, especially before the end of the war. That was a trip that marked my life, really. Um, I mean, it couldn't help but mark the life of a, of a North American person in that country at, at that time. Um, of course, I think of Cuba and Mexico and Nicaragua, where I lived for so many years. Uh, I very often think of Nicaragua today because of the tragedy that that has descended upon that country. Um, so different from the dreams that those of us who lived there in the 80s, early 80s had. Um, and another 
another thing that really um, influences my work and my life, and I think about it a lot, are ancient ruins. So um, I think about Machu Picchu, I think about Petra, I, I think about, um, you know, uh, ruins that I've been to, Corinth, uh, ruins here in the American Southwest, uh, Chaco, Mesa Verde. Um, so, you know, I, I often find myself thinking, dreaming about those places. Um, they're very alive for me. And they often sort of find their way into my work, either my poetry or, or, or other forms of writing. Um, yeah, because I mean, I, I always think, I, start, I was reading one of your poems uh, near the end of the book. I can't remember what title, but I'm like, you know, Margaret's a cowboy on some level. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, you know, like, you know, it's just a sort of description of, you know, a place in, you know, in near where you live. And just talk talking about uh, you know your perceptions there, and you had this sort of uh, I don't I don't know why I said cowboy, but that's what <laughs> came to my head reading it. You know? Maybe cowgirl. <laughs> yeah, cowgirl. <laughs> but um, well, uh, just to re relate to your travels again, uh, Pancho Savare has asked, uh, what do you think about the current state of affairs in Cuba? And maybe we could also add Nicaragua into that question too, because there's so much going on there right now. Well, you know, I've written at length about Cuba. I love the Cuban revolution. I lived there in its glory years in the second decade, uh, the whole decade of the seventies. Uh, my kids received their early education there. My two oldest kids through, through undergraduate work through college. Um, I love what the Cuban Revolution was then, and in some ways what it remains. I mean, I'm always sort of astonished that it still exists and very admiring of the fact that, um, you know, this tiny little poor besieged country has still has universal health care, um, free education and so forth and so on. Um, I'm, only, I'm also troubled by aspects of Cuba today. I, I'm troubled by the fact that um, there's been a lot of, uh, of pushback uh, on uh, free demonstrations, protests, uh, uh, individual freedoms and so forth. Um, I understand um, why a country like Cuba is defensive um, in terms of protecting itself but I don't agree with uh, curtailing any kind of uh, personal freedom. So I have I have criticisms, and I and there are things that trouble me. But um, I guess the the main thing is I just continue to admire uh, what the revolution is, but more what it could have become. In terms of Nicaragua, it's very different. It's um, you know I lived there in the early '80s, um, and it was so new and it was so wonderful to see the social changes that were taking place fast and very uniquely Nicaraguan. I mean, they they weren't tied to the Marxist model in the same way that Cuba was. Um, they were, um, you know, they had input from Sandinismo, from Sandino, from liberation theology, um, Feminism had had the second wave of feminism had, you know, a couple of decades already or a decade at least. Um, so, you know, women in Nicaragua um, in 1979 were, were very aware and very conscious of of their own needs and so forth. Um, so, as I say, I lived there in this wonderful time and um, the fact that Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo have really kidnapped the country. I mean, they've they've just, uh, power has gone to their heads to the extent that they've become dictators in my opinion. And um, I think most of your audience is probably aware of some of the recent events, the um, 222 prisoners were um, expelled from the country and, um, and then uh, Ortega and Murillo uh, revoked the citizenship of more than 400 Nicaraguans. I mean, that's something that goes against 
international law. You can't just supposedly yeah. you can't take citizenship away from your own country people. So um, public universities have shot people. More than 400 people have been murdered. Thousands of people are in exile, have been forced out of the country. Um, so it's a very, very serious, it's a police state. And um, it's really tragic to see this, uh, these people who continue to call themselves Sandinistas, um, you know, taking the this position. And uh, I don't, I, I've been very active in the past couple of years um, trying to advocate for, um, against the police state in, in Nicaragua, trying to put pressure on the government, uh, writing petitions, letters, speaking out and so forth. Um, and, you know, every time Ortega and Murillo do something uh, new, some new gr grotesque uh, law or, or action, I think, okay, so they've, they've really gone too far. This, this has got a boomerang, but, I don't know because um, it hasn't yet, you know. So we'll see. I think we just need to keep putting pressure on on the government and and um, and see how it unfolds. Um, well, so, someone I, I know the answer to this question, but I'll, I'll, somebody asked uh, or Nancy Hagelson asked again uh, about uh, knowing. Uh, did you know Ernesto Cardinal? And which are obvious, I know you did, but uh, yeah. I want to add to that too. Like, are, do you still have friends and you know comrades out in Nicaragua today? That oh, absolutely. Yeah. I know many people. I, I mean, most of my close friends, Nicaraguan friends, are have been forced out of the country, but they're mm -hmm. still very active in terms of the struggle. Um, Ernesto and I actually met as young poets in Mexico City in 1961 um, at at Philip Lamantia's house, as you know, we had yes. this this uh, uh, salon every night almost, and poets would gather from maybe a dozen poets from different countries, and uh, Ernesto was one of them, and I was one of them, and so that's where our friendship began. Um, and then, you know, we had this magazine, um, Sergio Mondragon and I had this magazine, The Plume Torn, according to Plumado, and... Um, so uh, Ernesto began, we began publishing some of his, we actually published him in English for the first time. Um, and then uh, time went by and he became involved in the story. He became a Catholic priest, as you know, and then he um, became involved in, in the revolution. And um, when the uh, Sandinistas won in 1979, he was the first, he was named uh, Nicaragua's first minister of culture. When I moved to Nicaragua uh, at the end of 1980, uh, I worked for him for a year in the Ministry of Culture. So um, we were close for many years. He died, as as you may know, a couple of years ago, and um, or maybe a little less. Um, but he he remains one of the great poets of the Spanish language of of our generation. Um, and uh, last question that came in, and since we're bringing it back through uh, Ernesto to poetry, uh, Lucy Kogler is, at, is asking, uh, um, were you influenced by Black Mountain poets like in, in your work? And uh, I, I, I want to just put a sidebar on that and just saying, I was reading about, um, I did a little reading about Paul Blackburn before uh, the thing and that he, you know, he was sort of lumped into that category himself in the new American poetry and didn't really, uh, you know, was sort of not happy with that. And so I was just, yeah. So what, 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 uh, what does that mean to you, uh, Black Mountain poetry? Well, yes, I was, I think, quite influenced by Black Mountain poets. Um, in the very, in my earliest years of beginning to write poetry in my early twenties, you know, when I lived in New York, um, I knew Creeley out here in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, we were also uh, friends for many years until his death. Um, so um, Creeley encouraged my work. Um, Joel Oppenheimer, who was also at Black Mountain, was of course the father of my, of my 
oldest child of my son. Um, so, you know, I knew the, I knew many of the Black Mountain poets. And so I think I was influenced by them in the sense that some of them encouraged me um, as a beginning poet, um, helped me um, in my work. Um, and I may have been influenced by uh, some of the Black Mountain, the voices themselves, the style, um, the poetic style briefly, although I wouldn't say if, in a very deep sense because I quickly uh, kind of went in another direction with my own work. But uh, I, I think of Black Mountain uh, with a great deal. I was never there, you know, I was never at Black Mountain, but I think of those poets uh, and that movement, that poetic movement with a great deal of appreciation because I was friends with with several of them and they encouraged me as a young poet. Yeah, and you can, I can definitely see, like, especially when I went through your selected poems a few years back, uh, you know, I, I could see, I could see something of a Creeley influence that seemed also mixed with a Williams influence, you know, or... Well, Williams yeah. was something else, yeah. I mean, Williams was really important to me, and yeah. um, I visited him several times um, in Patterson, in Rutherford, um, not too long before his death, and... Uh, you know, I would bring him my poems and um, he, by the time he had had his stroke and he was, um, he was, uh, he had, sometimes he would have me read new poems that he had written, which was really thrilling. He was very helpful to me. And I think I can really, I, I think I really do bear an influence of Williams in a very deep sense, much deeper than, than some of the Black Mountain poets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, we sh I, I think we're probably coming near the end, end of time. Um, maybe just, maybe we could just wrap up. Uh, tell, us, <clears throat> tell us what you're up to now. Like you said you have this one book home coming out, but you always have more than one book coming out. So what else, what else is, uh, can we look forward to? Well, actually, I, I'll tell you um, some of my latest and forthcoming books. I, um, uh, New Village Press in New York um, did a book of mine this past year called Artists in My Life, which is about um, visual artists whose work has inspired mine. And um, so that's out there. And then New Village also published, republished uh, an old book of mine called Risking a Somersault in the Air, which I think has new relevance today because it's a book that I originally published in 1988, I think, interviews with Nicaraguan writers, many of whom were Sandinista leaders. And so the uh, the recent edition or re-edition of that book is updated with, um, you know, it has a, a new long introduction uh, about Nicaragua today, all the problems and so forth. And it also, um, it also has updates on all the individual writers. Um, and then um, Caso Raca Press um, published a, um, a collection of essays of mine about a year and a half ago, ago called um, Thinking About Thinking. And that book has had a wonderful life so far. It's been translated into Spanish and Mexico and um, it's, it's short essays. And uh, they also did, Caso Raca also did uh, a book of mine last year, a book of poems called uh, Storm Clouds, Like Unkept Promises. It has um, some wonderful black and white photographs by my wife, Barbara. So that's a book that uh, I'm still, you know, reading from and so forth. Um, New Village will be publishing a... Uh, new book of my essays in the fall, also with um, with drawings by Barbara. Um, and that is called Luck. And it's a book of essays about a lot of the things that we've been talking about uh, tonight. That's coming out in October. And Casu Raka is also publishing another collection of my poems, uh, also in October of this year called uh, Home. And that's the book I mentioned before where all, all the poems are about the idea of home or the many ideas of home. So um, so that's sort of what I have going on at the moment. 
Well, that sounds like a, uh, a pretty decent batch. Uh, oh, of and and another uh, another selected poems. You mentioned the selected poems um, that came out about. I don't know. I guess it was in twenty nineteen. No, Eighteen, I think. Eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was my work from selections of my poetry from um, nineteen fifty nine to uh, twenty eighteen. Um, Wings Press is publishing a new uh, selected poems from uh, twenty eighteen to the present. Uh, oh, wow. Selections from books. So that's also coming out in the fall, uh, selections from books of poetry that uh, have been published since that first selected poems. Okay. Well, <laughs> your, uh, you know, your productivity and energy is always uh, a huge inspiration to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just lo love hearing about what you're, what you're up to uh, as a writer. Um, but I, I guess we, where we should be maybe at the end, maybe Peter, uh, if you want to come back in and, uh, uh you know wrap us up yeah um margaret congratulations for two more yet amazing books and it's wonderful that you're so prolific and we look forward to the next ones and, and thank you for gracing our halls garrett for doing the honors really appreciate it oh, i also like to thank everyone in the audience from all over the country and actually from different parts of the world uh, and before we sign off, I also want to remind everyone City Lights is open for business. If you're in the neighborhood, please come on down, browse our stacks. We're located in San Francisco's historic North Beach District. We're open seven days a week. Our new hours are Monday through Thursday, 11 to 8, and Friday through Sunday, 11 to 9. We're getting back to our pre-pandemic hours. As always, tonight's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events like this one, a publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So good night, everybody. Please take care. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Garrett. And thank you, everybody who was here. And um, I hope to be live in the store at some point in the fall. So uh, we'll get you in. We'll get you in. That. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Margaret. That was bye -bye. great.